Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I am Mitchell Cronenberg, President and Chief Scientific Officer for the La Jolla Institute for Immunology. We do very important work here and we're very proud of it. And that's why we're very happy to share it with you at this series of webinars. So the La Jolla Institute for Immunology is one of the leading immunology focused research units in the world. And we study many diseases that are related to the immune system. And that includes uh, not only infections, but things like Alzheimer's disease and heart disease, which you may not think of in the context of immunity, but which are definitely related to immunity and inflammation. And we already have made a number of critical breakthroughs. And recently we learned that one of our technologies is moving into a, a very large phase three trial for eczema or very severe atopic dermatitis. Next slide, please. So just to give you a little bit of background, uh, I know many of you have attended other webinars of this series. Um, <clears throat> we were founded in 1988. We have almost 500 employees and many of our employees uh, have advanced degrees, MDs uh, or PhD degrees, and they're from all over the world. Um, we uh, have 20 independent laboratories, meaning the laboratories decide the kind of work that they're going to focus on. Uh, and our lab heads are very successful at getting uh, NIH grants. And if you look at the bottom at the financials, you can see that uh, we run on approximately $80 million a year. And a very good part of it comes from a, a very competitive federal granting process. But other sources are also important, including various kinds of academic and corporate partners and philanthropy, which makes a very critical contribution to what we do. Our goal is to engage in a world-class biomedical research program on the immune system and to conduct and share and partner so that the results of the discoveries will make contributions to the betterment of human health. We don't treat patients, but we do the kind of research every day that's going to lead to better diagnosis, treatments, and cures. Next, please. In thinking about immunology, it touches so many diseases because immune cells go everywhere in your body. But we've organized our work to promote collaboration and, and feedback and uh, cross fertilization of ideas into three centers, autoimmunity and inflammation, infectious diseases and vaccines, and cancer, cancer immunotherapy. But on the right, you can see a list of the conditions that we're actually researching here at La Jolla Institute for Immunology. Next, please. So these are the investigators in our Center for Cancer Immunotherapy. Uh, nearly half of our cohort, or approximately half of our cohort of 20 investigators. And we are studying how the immune system responds to cancers, how we can engineer the immune system to make uh, a better immune response and to uh, generate, for example, vaccines to give a better immune response to cancer and to understand adverse events that can occur from cancer immunotherapy. Next, please. And just to give you a couple of very recent highlights. So just, uh, just this month, Alex Sete and Bjorn Peters were awarded a grant from the National Cancer Institute to launch the Cancer Epitope Database and Analysis Resource, or CEDA, CEDAR. What is this? So uh, this is a database that will catalog all the mutations found in cancer cells uh, that are potential epitopes, meaning they can be recognized by the immune system. This is very important for designing anti-cancer vaccines. Next, please. Uh, the American Cancer Society has awarded Timothy Baffey in the laboratory of Anjana Rao uh, a three-year fellowship uh, just this month to support re research into the genetic drivers of acute myeloid leukemia, a very deadly cancer that's difficult to control. And next, please. 
And we have updated uh, a cancer immunotherapy resource guide. And uh, this, this resource guide provides information on the types of cancer immunotherapies available, because there isn't just one type. There are several ways that we can uh, use the immune system to fight cancer more effectively. And it's available for free download to everyone. And you can find the link on our website. Next, please. So uh, today we're gonna to talk about uh, how some uh, fast growing tumors hide from our immune system, uh, despite the fact that, th that cancers do contain mutations, which can make them look foreign to your immune system. And this was a talk that will be given uh, by Dr. Sonia Sharma, who's a associate professor at the Institute. Next, please. Oh, okay, thanks. So in March, 2021, uh, Sonia published a very important paper in Nature Immunology on this, what's called the sting pathway. And this is a pathway that basically activates your immune system, uh, the innate immune system or the early responders and can be used to fight cancer. Um, and what Sonia and her colleagues found is a key activator of the sting pathway. Next, please. So our speaker today, uh, the main event, if you will, is uh, Dr. Sonia Sharma, an associate professor. She's been with the Institute since 2013. I won't give biographical information because her slide will give you a little, but what I can, what I can tell you is that she is um, a very dynamic investigator whose research is very deep and very thoughtful, and it includes some of the really most advanced technologies. And she has uh, recently, in recent years, devoted herself uh, very significantly to understanding some of the adverse or negative events that can arise when we use the immune system to fight cancer. So without delay, Sonia, please take it away. Thanks so much, Mitch, for that really, really nice introduction and uh, really kind. I'm going to share my screen. And start the presentation. So as Mitch mentioned, the title of my talk today is Building Better Cancer Immun Immunotherapy. In other words, as you'll see as we progress through the talk, making treatments, current treatments for cancer safer. Before I get into it though, um, as Mitch mentioned, I'd just like to give you a little bit of an introduction to me and to my lab. I was born and raised in Montreal, Quebec, which is in Canada. And my parents had moved there uh, from India in the 1960s. Um, I did all of my schooling in Montreal. I got my BSc, my Bachelor of Science, and my PhD degrees there. And I guess I kind of always wanted to be a scientist. Although I'm not really certain why, I think I just really wanted to do, to do the things that are in the books, to see if they were true and see if I could add to that. And since I was kind of terrible at creative writing, scientific papers seemed like a much better choice for me. So after I did my PhD, I ended up moving to Boston, Boston, Massachusetts. And this was specifically to do postdoctoral training um, at Harvard Med Medical School in the lab of Dr. Anjana Rao. Um, you may remember her from a few slides back and Dr. Patrick Hogan. And these are LJI faculty who I've worked really closely with. And Anjana and Patrick are really actually one of the main reasons that I'm here. I initially came because I just really loved working with them. And in 2013, I was lucky enough to stay here as an assistant professor at LJI. And, and since then, I've, I've really made this the home for my basic research program. And it's been incredibly fulfilling, I would say, because I really get to achieve kind of the two main goals that are important to me. As Mitch mentioned, we study uh, cancer and autoimmunity. My lab tries to use kind of a human's first approach in order to do basic science, but also develop new therapies for these two very important immune-related disease. And my second goal is to mentor young researchers along their path. And those things come really nicely together, or I think they have in my lab. And I'm just giving you a little picture of my lab. 
um, and the folks who are working with me. And you'll meet Pre um, later on. So to get into the meat of our discussion today, the th specific therapy that is the focus of this um, seminar, this event, is cancer immunotherapy, which is based in general on the premise that the human immune system can be harnessed to, to attack tumors. I think that any immunologist here at LJI could have told us this 20 years ago, that cancer immunotherapy is possible and that it's a good idea. And there was plenty of basic research science showing that the human immune system can be harnessed to attack tumors. But it really needed the development of a breakthrough therapy that could actually work for human cancers to convince non-immunologists, clinicians, and of course, patients. One of these breakthrough therapies is immune checkpoint blockade therapy, which was actually developed incidentally, specifically and directly from basic immunology research on viruses. So viruses can help us out, right? But is immune checkpoint blockade really a breakthrough? Let me give you two examples. First, former President Jimmy Carter was successfully treated with immune checkpoint blockers for metastatic melanoma, one of the most aggressive and untreatable cancers. And you can see this quote underneath directly from the former president, after the cancer immunotherapy, they didn't find any cancer at all. Secondly, Ricky Rocket, who's the drummer for Poison, that's a 90s hair band for any of you who don't know. He was treated here at UCSD Moore's Cancer Center by our very own Dr. Ezra Cohen for throat cancer using an experimental cancer immunotherapy that included the same drug therapy that was given to former President Carter. And this was also extremely successful. So how do immune checkpoint blockers work? Well, this is a schematic that just shows you how this occurs. In order for a T cell to attack and destroy a tumor cell, it has to bind it. It has to come up close to it. And here you can see that in the schematic, the tumor cell and the T cell are in close contact. And this interaction on the bottom between the tumor antigen and the T cell receptor must occur in order for that T cell to destroy that tumor cell. However, this interaction above between a molecule on the tumor called PDL1 and a molecule on the T cell called PD1, you see they're named similarly because they interact directly. This actually blocks the, 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 the interaction below, or the, actually it's more like it, it's, a, it's an off switch that turns the tumor off and it's not able to do its job. So immune checkpoint blockers work, as you can see on the right side, they're actually antibodies that bind to the upper molecules, either PDL1 or PD1. And because they're blocked, they can't interact. The off switch for the T cell isn't turned off. And therefore the T cell is turned on and can properly destroy the tumor cell. That sounds great. And it really is. But what are the limitations? Well, what if I told you that one of the main reasons patients have to discontinue immune checkpoint blocker therapy is the emergence of unwanted off-target autoimmune or autoinflammatory complications. And this likely occurs due to the immune checkpoint blockers boosting our immune system. They boost T cell responses. These are actually called immune related adverse events. And they have been um, observed in the clinic to affect almost any tissue in patients who are receiving ICB therapies. In fact, up to 30% of patients will experience IRAEs, and some of them will experience what we call severe IRAEs. And these, these can include myocarditis, type 1 diabetes, colitis, and many others. These severe IRAEs are what actually cause discontinuation of the potentially life-protecting ICB therapy. And sometimes they can have permanent effects as well because these are serious autoimmune complications. This IRAE event has been called the Achilles heel of cancer immunotherapy. This is just a pie chart showing you the different outcomes of cancer immunotherapy. This is kind of generalizing a bit. Most of the data is obtained from lung cancer or melanoma. But in general, about a third of patients will have, as shown in the green, a good response to cancer immunotherapy, to ICB, in that the tumor volume will be reduced. 
about one third or less may have no response. And that's really the subject of another talk. But about a third, as we discussed, will have adverse response. And that is the development of IRAEs. And a subset of these patients will have severe IRAEs. So in my lab, we wanted to ask the question, can we study these patients? Can we use our humans first approach to learn more about IRAEs? And through learning more about IRAEs, can we develop new and better therapies to build better cancer immunotherapy drugs? And one of the things in my lab that we know from research recently in my lab and others is that metabolites, metabolites present in the blood, these are small molecules that are present in our blood, influence and direct communication within the immune system. And this is because metabolites directly affect the activity of immune cells, including T cells, of course. When we think metabolites and we think metabolism, we usually think about their energetic function. But as you can see on the right, they also have an important signaling function. And as I discussed, this means that they basically talk to immune cells and can direct their activity. That's a kind of more recent understanding of metabolism. So the hypothesis that we went in the lab was, if we can measure blood metabolites properly, can we characterize them? Can metabolites, since they control immune cells and the immune system, can they control the response to cancer immunotherapy to immune checkpoint blockade? And maybe, can we find blood metabolites that could protect against IRAEs? And so if we think about the human individual with each of these different colored dots representing the diversity, the chemical diversity of the metabolites that are present in our blood. You can see this represents a whole host of different chemistries, different molecules, some of which we know, but many of which we don't know what they are because simply because we've never measured them before. But if we could take this unruly group of molecules and measure them in cancer patients who have an adverse response, IRAEs, no response or a positive response, that is tumor regression, can we make specific associations or find metabolites that function to control each of these? And if we could do that, since metabolites are really end stage effector molecules, they're actually natural products. Can we use these natural products to put them back in as therapies to control the cancer immunotherapy response? So that was kind of the idea going in. Can we find functional metabolites that will influence the outcome of immune checkpoint blockade therapy? Before I show you this actual study, I just wanna show you, demonstrate to you how we measure metabolites in human blood. If you remember from the last slide, I showed you that there are many different chemicals. Really, there are tens of thousands of different metabolites in our blood. And this makes it incredibly complex and kind of incredibly difficult to, to accurately, reliably, and robustly measure these things in, in a human blood sample. But that's what we need to be able to do in order to make reliable and accurate measurements and associations with those disease outcomes. So the technology that we use is called mass spectrometry technology. And you probably had a pretty good crash course in that from Sam Meyer's last live from the lab. So I don't really need to go into the technology too much, but what I do want to show you is how we take that process, that incredibly sophisticated process, and we automate it. Because if we automate it, then we can reduce some of the sample to sample variability. We can reduce the time it takes to, do, to perform each sample and each to analyze each metabolite. And we can make many measurements in more patients and therefore learn more. I'm just gonna give you a demo of this. So everything as you will see is done in microplates and those plates have 400 different samples. So here the machine is basically picking up a sample that is basically extracted metabolites from a human blood sample. And the machine very efficiently picks it up. It's not actually red, it's just pseudo colored so we can see it. By this time it has nothing to do with blood. It's just the extracted metabolites. And all those different dots are a different metabolite and they're separated over a column that allows them to be a little bit less complex in order for the machine, 
And as they go, there they go into the machine. So this complex solution is separated in order to be readable and then read by the mass spectrometer where every one of those, well, they're peaks, but they look like lines because they're all squished together. Each of those is a different metabolite. It's a different chemical and they look awfully close together. But when we do the analysis, we take a computer program to stretch that out so we can individually analyze each different peak. What's different from our approach compared to Sam's, for example, if you remember from Sam's talk, he mostly looks like very, looks at large complex proteins. These molecules are really smaller. In some ways they're simpler. And so we can measure more of them in each sample. Oh, let's go on, we don't wanna see it again. So for our metabolomic study, what did we do? Well, we wanted to study metabolites in the blood of cancer patients receiving ICB therapy. So you can see this is just a representation in blue. We chose a patient study, a group of patients who are all undergoing cancer immunotherapy. We were able to collaborate with clinicians around the world to get blood samples, both before therapy and then at serial time points after their therapy and analyze these samples by our mass spec based metabolomics method that I just showed you. And I just wanna show you on this right side, each of these colored peaks uh, lines represents a different IRAE, rash, liver toxicity, colitis, or hypophysitis, for example. And the beginning of the, the line shows you in weeks when each of these occurs. And you can see that most of these IRAEs arise a few weeks, maybe three or four weeks, they start to occur three or four weeks after initiation of the ICB therapy. That's how we know that's what's causing it because they occur, they're so tightly associated. And they extend out to about 12 weeks. And so we kind of concentrated our sampling to get blood draws to analyze metabolites here at time zero before anything happens. And then throughout, the treatment in order to best capture changes in metabolites. And you're gonna see that we wanted to not just look at one group of patients, we wanted to have validated robust data by looking at three different cancer patient cohorts or studies from which we were able to get very similar blood samples before therapy and then three to 12 weeks after therapy. And so just looking at it again, what kind of outcomes are we looking for? Well, this is just hypothetical, but if you look at these graphs on the left side in the red graph, we were really looking at, if you think about this dark red line as patients who, re who, who received ICB therapy, but then developed severe IRAEs, we were looking for things that were different um, in the group that had severe IRAEs compared to the group that either had no IRE or a mild one. So we were looking things that were at metabolites that were perhaps significantly up in the severe, as you can see on the right in left in the red, or things that were significantly down in those who had severe IREs, as you can see in the blue line. So the first patient study that we undertook was a study of patients in the UK who have advanced melanoma. And this was with our clinical collaborator, Christian, Dr. Christians Audensmeyer. And these melanoma patients were receiving Urovoy or ipilimumab as a treatment for their advanced melanoma. And so what did we see? Well, if we look at the three, remember the three buckets of folks here, we have folks who had no IRAE after ICB treatment we have those who had what's called a grade one, grade two, that's considered a mild IRAE. And although it, it can be very uh, invasive and it's, it's not a good outcome, it's not an outcome that necessarily makes them have to go off their therapy. But the third group, those of grade three or four IRAEs, those patients are those who have to discontinue therapy and may have permanent um, have side effects. So we concentrate on this group. And what we did is called an excursion analysis, which is basically a statistical analysis when you're measuring a lot of things and you're associating them with a specific outcome. So we did, we performed an analyzed excursion to no IRE, excursion to mild, or excursion association to severe. And what did we found, find? 
we found a molecule called LPC that had excursions specifically to severe IRAEs. What that means practically is that in every single patient in this patient study who received Yervoy, all of the patients who developed severe IRAEs after Yervoy therapy had a significant decrease in a specific metabolite. This is just one metabolite called LPC. And it actually has two different forms, but it's the, essentially the same molecule. So this LPC molecule was decreasing in the blood of pay, only of patients who had developed severe IRE in the first patient study. Just to give you a little bit of chemistry, I just wanna show you, remember, we, remember those mass spec lines that we um, were detecting? What I'm showing you on the top in, in black is the LPC, the lines. These are basically relate to the weights. The mass charge ratio is what we call it. It's a chemical fingerprint on the mass spec that identifies LPC as LPC. This is what we detected in blood plasma. And this is what we detected in red when we actually ran a synthetic standard that we know is LPC. And you can see that they're absolutely the same. So we're pretty sure what we're looking at in blood plasma is the right thing and that we've identified it properly, which is important. So we know that we do, that LPC levels were changed in, patient, in our first patient study. These were again, melanoma patients who received Yervoy and that the LPC levels were dropping in patients who developed severe side effects. But the question was, do we see this in other incidences as well? So we studied two additional patient cohorts or patient studies. The second one shown in green is melanoma or lung cancer patients who, who were receiving Keytruda, which is another immune checkpoint blockade blocker. This is actually the one that President Jimmy Carter received as well as Ricky Rocket. They both received Keytruda. And this is probably right now, Keytruda is, I would say the most commonly prescribed ICB therapy. And the reason for that is that it is actually because it causes slightly fewer IRAEs than your VOI does. So we wanted to really look at this Keytruda as well. And then uh, this um, group of patients is, is based in the US. They're on the East Coast. It's a clinical trial that is um, being performed by Yale University. And our collaborator on this was uh, Dr. Sue Keck, who uh, used to be at Yale, but now she's here locally at the SOC. So that was patient study two. Patient study three is our own UCSD Moore's Cancer Center um, patient studies. And these um, patients, we decided to look at patients with different, you know, different tumor types, not just melanoma or just lung cancer, but we really wanted to see if this was applicable to other cancers. And we also wanted to see if it was applicable not only to Keytruda and Yervoy, but maybe to some other experimental therapies as well, which is really a, a strength of UCSD Moore's Cancer Center. And our co uh, collaborator there is Dr. Sandeep Patel. And I'm just gonna tell you, not necessarily show you, in, was that we saw something similar. In each of these independent studies, when we specifically performed excursion for those patients who developed severe IRAEs due to Yervoy or Keytruda or others, the severe IRAE patients all had reduced levels of LPC in their blood as measured by our metabolomics. So then we asked ourselves, well, there's this strong link in our study between LPC and autoimmunities due to immune checkpoint blockade. Does this have anything to do with natural autoimmunity or na spontaneous autoimmune disease, which of course can occur independently of ICB therapy? And so to answer this question, sorry about that, we looked at a different patient study we looked at a, a large study of 2000 patients called the FinRisk study. And this is a study to look at disease development in community dwelling patients. So, th so these are individuals who are just so responsible. They have agreed to be a part of this study over 30 years. And when they go to their doctor, they just, they get an extra blood drop because they wanna be part of this longitudinal study that allows us to look back and say, if they do develop autoimmunity, for example, can we go back to their blood and study that? So this is what we did. We accessed the FinRisk study. We accessed the blood of those patients. We analyzed our 
metab metabolites in the blood of those patients. And we already know that some of them have already developed autoimmune disease. And what we found in these patients was that LPC was down compared to the patients who didn't develop autoimmunity, telling us that there is a link between low LPC and autoimmunity. So we talked about this kind of continuation that we've seen. This is a pattern that we're seeing not only in one patient group, but four different patient groups at this time. And so we asked ourselves the question, can we make this into a therapy? If, if LPC is missing, can we add it back and change the outcome of IRAEs? And to do that, we went to a mouse model because in a mouse model, we can actually intervene. And what you're looking at on the left is just a measurement of the blood of mice who are treated with Yervoy. These are actually humanized mice that um, when they're treated with Yervoy, they develop IRAEs much like the patients do. And each different dot on the left is a different mouse and mouse blood metabolomics analysis of LPC. And what we saw was that in those mice, once they received Yervoy and developed IREs, if they had a lot of toxicity as shown here, they actually had lower amounts of LPC because LPC is going down. So this is for example, a mouse that had a high level of toxicity or IRAE, but had this level, a lower level of LPC, whereas the mice that didn't have any toxicity actually had higher LPC. So we're recapitulating the same thing in the mouse model, which means that it's a good mouse model to look at. So on the right, we're actually doing the experiment. We have three groups of dots. The black dots are untreated mice who received Yervoy. Uh, excuse me, un untreated mice, sorry, no Yervoy, sorry. The, um, these red circles, are those mice who received Yervoy and they have a high toxicity because again, you're seeing something very similar as you do in the humans. But when we put back LPC supplements, we actually decreased the toxicity in those mice who received Yervoy. And what does that tell us? On the left, we know that LPC is down in the mice. And on the right, the LPC supplement actually did what it was supposed to do. When we put it back, we were able to protect against the IRE in this sense, in this case, it was the colon damage that we were looking at. So what's next? Well, we've shown you that LPC deficiency is associated with more IRAEs during ICB therapy or more autoimmunity in human patients. We also showed you in the mouse data that LPC supplements promote less IRAE, IRAEs in that model. Remember that LPC is a natural product. It's actually a, a fat or an oil. And it, so it can be actually administered as a, as a supplement. And so our next question that we're asking, can we develop natural LPC supplements at the right dose? And that's really important to treat IRAEs and maybe human autoimmunity. What do we need to do this? What are the next steps? Well, dose matters. So I would say that at this point, we really need a qualified analytical chemist to look at that LPC and say, you know, this is the best way to make that supplement. And I would say that we would need a good pharmacologist in order to help us dose this thing right. And that's where I'm going to end. Um, and I'd just like to thank you all uh, for listening. And, and we're going to, I'm introducing Pri, who's a postdoc in my lab, who basically does this, who extracts these metabolites um, from patient samples in order to run on the mess spec. And Pri's great. Um, she's a great pipetter. She has good hands, uh, much like my whole lab. Um, but you'll see that it's easier to do these things in an automated manner than it is to do manually. And I'm gonna end there. Good afternoon and welcome to Life from Lab. Good afternoon and welcome to Life from Lab. My name is, my name is Priyanka Saminathan and I'm gonna walk you through an exciting project that is being undertaken here at the Sharma Lab. As Dr. Sharma explained a few minutes back, IRAE or immune related adverse events occur in about 10 to 30% of cancer patients receiving immune therapy. Today, IRAE remains to be one of the leading reasons for patients to discontinue their therapy. And under adverse conditions, it can even prove to be fatal. But not all patients experience IRAE similarly. Not all patients develop immune complications either. We hypothesize that 
patient sedum and blood contain potentially beneficial metabolites that could protect from IRAE. Therefore, the main goal and aim of this project is the identification and characterization of these bioactive lipids and metabolites from cancer patient cohorts. The first step in the identification of these metabolites is the processing and preparation of hundreds of human serum samples. Today, I'm gonna to walk you through what this process looks like. We first begin by pouring out our frozen human serum sample on ice. Once thawed out, these samples will then be precisely pipetted, mixed, and aliquoted into 96 well microtiter plates. This step is a key step in the processing and data collection and analysis. Again, here we have the sedum sample, precise mixing, followed by precise aliquoting of these sedum samples is key for data analysis and acquisition. The next step, we process these samples by mixing them with the adequate reagent. So here I have the reagent. Again, aliquoting this reagent to my sedum sample with precise mixing is key to this step. Here we go. The agent to our sample and mix vigorously. Now, as you can see, the processing of just three samples has taken me a couple of minutes. Therefore, this process is highly labor intensive and time consuming. Manual pipetting, on the other hand, has been known to introduce errors into the data collection process itself. So you can imagine pipetting errors and insufficient mixing of reagents can be disastrous to a study of this proportion. Therefore, to overcome these problems that we face with manual pipetting, we have chosen to employ the use of a fully automated cutting edge workstation. So what you have here is a, a robotic arm that can be precisely manipulated and preset to get the desired outcomes. Over here, right at the center, you have the head of the robotic arm, pipetting samples and gradually moving it to our micro titer plates. This is followed by a quick mixing process. And the pipette moves back to allo allocate the samples to the designated spots on the microtiter plate. Once mixed, these samples can then be processed by mass spectroscopy to analyze the bioactive lipids and metabolites. This robotic arm and device comes with a airflow chamber, which is filtered, as well as a closed door chamber, which allows to, con to, to contain cross-contamination of these samples. Now, using the software for this device, we can precisely design how much volume of the sample is analyzed, the rate at which the samples are analyzed, and the number of samples that can be analyzed. This machine can approximately analyze 100 samples at a given time. As you can imagine, this high throughput machine can analyze thousands of samples at a fraction of the time that it would take me to do this manually. Therefore, this machine, this robotic arm, is a highly throughput, cutting edge system that allows us to get to the goals of our aim. Thank you so much for joining us today at this webinar. 
Up next, our incoming president, Dr. Erika Olman Safaya, has some concluding remarks. Thank you. Good morning, afternoon. I'm Erica Ullman Sapphire. I am also a professor at La Jolla Institute for Immunology, and I'm the incoming president of this institute. Now, when I was young, I lost some family members to cancer. And at the time, I felt powerless. And that inspired a career in research, because at the time, the doctors had nothing to offer. And I wanted to help put something in the hands of those doctors so that someone else wouldn't lose family members like that. Although my laboratory works on infectious disease and looks at the causes of infectious disease that also trigger cancer and autoimmunity and other things, um, I came here for that broader context. Most diseases have an immune component. You know the immune system fights infectious diseases. You've seen how the immune system can be used for precision control of cancer. You know that overactivity of the immune system can cause diabetes and other aspects of autoimmunity and painful inflammation. All of these things are connected. I recently lost another person to cancer. And as I said goodbye to him, I promised that the institute that we work in would do everything we could and I would do everything I could to support the investigators here in bringing those new therapies to light that doctors don't have anything to offer those patients unless a scientist like Dr. Sharma and Pre have discovered that, advanced it, figured out how to improve it and put it in their hands through basic then translational and clinical research. The work that Sonia does very much fits into our vision at La Jolla Institute for Immunology of life without disease. What can we discover? What can we advance? What can we forward to improve human health? How do we achieve discovery upon discovery? And that's what you've seen today. There was the groundbreaking work that you could use immune therapy of checkpoint therapy to find and destroy individual cancer cells, but it had that Achilles heel. Work of the Sharma lab will help us explain how we can get beyond that Achilles heel and make those therapies useful. And she does that with those precision instruments you saw. And she does that by understanding that everything in the immune system and all of these diseases are connected by fundamental aspects of human immunology. And that is the beauty of LJI. That is why I came here. That all of the different research labs, whether they begin from infectious disease or begin from cancer or begin from autoimmunity inflammation, they have tools that can pivot in different ways. We had investigators that rapidly pivoted to address and understand COVID-19. We have investigators like Sonia that can see, that can harness the connection between cancer and autoimmune disease. That foundational work done in each one of these labs, and these investigators are the best in the world at what they do, that foundational work in these laboratories here at LJI is advancing our ability to detect and treat and live life without disease in multiple areas, vasculitis, cancer, and even more. These basic findings have significant translational promise. They will be brought forward to clinical use. And we've done it before. And we have multiple therapies and clinical trials and advancing these promising treatments for human disease. A lot of that comes from gifts from people like you. And that philanthropy of people like you and me that have had it with losing family members to cancer or watching family members struggle with type one diabetes or, or the pain and devastating impacts of autoimmune disease that wanna make a difference, that wanna make sure that we can put the best minds on these problems and put these discoveries into the hands of the doctors to treat our family and our friends so no one else loses spouses, children, business partners. Philanthropy can be on a large scale like that robot that will work 24 seven to screen a multitude of samples and look at a lot of different metabolites to find the very best ones that are gonna help us advance the therapies. Philanthropy can also be on a smaller scale. And what we need today, we need to hire a chemist and a pharmacologist to accelerate these studies and metabolites. We need help giving two young people jobs. And if you can help it was even something small to contribute toward those salaries. We can put those people in the Sharma lab. You can launch their research careers and you can provide those discoveries 
that will advance our abilities to deliver precision immunotherapy. Immunotherapy is one of the most exciting new ways to treat cancer. The ability of your immune system to detect and destroy individual cancer cells before they become a tumor or find and destroy those individual cells before they can metastasize is so effective and so much more appealing than surgery, radiation, chemotherapy. It's research that we need to support and it's research that will advance human health being done here. We're grateful for your attention today. I'm so proud of the work that Dr. Sharma and all the other investigators are doing here. And you can join us, you can help us. If you go to lji.org, you can find ways to contribute with gifts or to contribute by participating in studies. So now I think it might be the most exciting part of the program where we return to Dr. Sharma and our current president and chief scientific officer, Mitch Cronenberg, for a live Q&A. So team, if you can put back the cameras, we'll talk to them and we'll hear some viewer questions. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Erica, and thank you, Priyanka, and thank you, Sonia, for a wonderful talk. So I'm going to fire the questions at you both, but predominantly to Sonia, our speaker today. So first one, um, you showed us that people who get immune checkpoint sometimes get adverse effects or autoimmunity, uh, but is there uh, in the absence of such treatments, which are recent, is there a connection between autoimmunity and cancer? Are people with autoimmune disease more likely to get cancer or vice versa? Great question. Um, and the answer is yes. We're not going to ask easy questions here. <laughs> right. Thanks for those. And, and the answer is yeah. And, and it's kind of counterintuitive because you might think autoimmunity, your immune system is more active, a more active immune system should be better. But the fact of the matter, it's more like, even though it's overactive, it's not tuned. It's like, you know, driving a car that doesn't have a tune up. It's, it's not, do, it's doing it, but it's not doing it properly. And that's why folks who have an autoimmune um, condition, their immune system may not be finely tuned to respond to the cancer. In, in a defined way. And the opposite is also true that um, folks with cancer can be predisposed to autoimmunity, not only if they perhaps get ICB therapies, but also because that cancer might be affecting the growth of immune cells. And so um, those immune cells, like the B cells or the T cells, th those might be growing out of control and cause the autoimmunity. Yeah, you know, one aspect of the immune system is inflammation the redness and pain and swelling that you get, which is often a product predominantly of what we call innate immunity or the rapid responders. And chronic inflammation uh, can be associated with, with cancer, uh, increased incidence of cancer at least. And exactly to your point, one example is <clears throat> inflammatory bowel disease is associated with an increased uh, risk of uh, colon cancer. And also uh, chronic inflammation in the liver is associated with increased uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. So, so exactly as you said, some types of immune responses, particularly chronic inflammation, really uh, can, can contribute to, to the genesis of cancers. Okay, so uh, another question and, and not an easy one, but you did, that was a great answer by the way. Um, so what about diet? Um, because you you know you mentioned um, the LPC and all that, so can uh, can diet influence the outcome of cancer immunotherapy, or um, or how might it even influence the immune system in the absence of cancer immunotherapy? That's a really interesting question, and and I guess that in theory I would say absolutely yes. That for example, if we're talking about metabolites, which was the subject of this talk. Um, there are a lot of metabolites in our blood that are derived from the environment and they're derived from our diet or they're changed in some way by our diet. So the short answer is of course, yes. Um, the second answer is that, you know, some of the, and again, to make it really specific to this talk, but in some of those functional studies we showed you, we actually fed the LPC back to the mice through their diet and it was able to have an effect. But in saying that, the thing to understand, I think is that dosage matters. And um, in, in, when we're talking about diet, the, the biggest factor that's unknown there is that it's difficult when you're, it's a diet associated 
supplement, it's difficult to ensure that if you're eating something or eating something with beneficial ingredients, that enough of that beneficial ingredient and not too much, that just the right, it's like Goldilocks, you know, not too much, just enough um, that, that you have that. And so uh, that said, I'm a big proponent about the health of the immune system being being related to the health of, of the individual. So I always say that, you know, a good diet and it just gives your, um, it's just good for your immune system in general. And that also has to do with metabolism because a healthy met metabolism promotes a healthy immune system. And that's related to diet and exercise. Yes, yes. But I don't think we're, we're not ready to make a specific recommendation. No, uh, because as than, I said, dosage matters. Yeah, right. other than a balanced, healthy diet. I mean, it's not, uh, we don't want anyone to run out and get an LPC supplement if they, uh, from Sigma Chemicals or somebody else. No, and, and, oh, that's okay. what was, and that goes back to my point about saying that when you're talking about diet studies, dosage really matters. And we don't even know at this case, human is not a mouse, which we know so well. Um, yeah. So we don't, we don't know yet how that translate that dosage. Okay. And LPC is a fat. You don't want to be eating extra fat, right? That's gross. Well, it depends whether you're paleo or not. I guess. That's so right. Never mind. Uh, so, uh, so why does cancer immunotherapy sometimes work initially, and then stop working? That's a great question, and that's that's the that's the question right now for certain cancers. For example, for renal cell carcinoma, uh, which is. Uh, really aggressive cancer. This is one of the things that happens there. And, and I think in, as well as in some type of liver cancers, because you mentioned that before, that the immunotherapy works and then it stops working. So there's kind of two main thoughts right now. The first is the, the genetics of the tumor. Tumors, much like viruses, are able to mutate. They're able to change their DNA in order to maintain and promote their growth. So the first one, it's thought that tumor mutations that occur after the immunotherapy, allow it to grow even in and change. And the second one is actually metabolism. Um, tumors change not only their genetics, but they change their metabolism. They're kind of like, they change their metabolism to be the bad neighbors. So it's like, you know, they're throwing trash, they're making noise, they've got the bad dog who's barking and they're really bad neighbors for T cells. T cells mm -hmm. don't wanna be there. And it actually, it translates more to the tumor cells eat up all of the good nutrients yeah, that even yeah. the T cells need. Yeah. And that's kind of the second thought. And what, what, is, what happens there? If, there's, if the tumors are such bad neighbors, you know, the T cells can't be there. And if the T cells aren't there, immunotherapy doesn't work. Yeah. Um, Erica, how often is the availability of the latest technology a limiting step? for progress in cancer research or other research going on at the La Jolla Institute? Well, the technology is key to making that advance, right? You can't discover something new unless you've done an experiment no one's done before. And what's really clear with immunology is how individual it is. Some people get sick, others don't. Some people get a cancer, others don't. Some can be treated, others can't. It's understanding that precision nature of your individual levels of metabolites, your individual genetics, your exposure history. Um, this is true for viruses and this is true for cancers as well. We need those precision instruments in order to tell the differences. For almost no disease, there is a one size fits all therapy. Things like that mass spectrometer help us understand the variety of molecules and the differences between people. Things like that cryo electron microscope help us actually see those differences so we can know which therapy to launch. Having the technology that tells us the differences between health and disease is essential to making any advance forward. Thanks, yeah, perfect. Um, I'll have one, at least one more for each of you. Um, I'll go back to Sonia for a moment. Um, do you think in the future, every cancer will be treated with immunotherapy as a first line and uh, even replacing surgery, radiation and chemotherapy? 
It's a great question. It's uh, already a first line therapy uh, for certain cancers, lung cancer being uh, one of them. But what I see more replace is a strong word. I think that it'll become used in conjunction with and the future of cancer immunotherapy, and Erica alluded to this, is that it's combination therapy. It's going to be combination because as Erica said, no one cancer is the same, no two are the same, excuse me. And so it's gonna be about combination. So I don't see it as much of a replacement, but I do see it becoming a first line therapy for many different cancer types in conjunction uh, with surgery when that's possible. Yeah, I wonder, sometimes we give these immune therapies after people have had treatments that seem to be immune depleting, uh, you know, toxic chemicals uh, that, that are bad for cancer cells, but also bad for immune cells or other kinds of uh, radiation treatments that, um, yep. you know, uh, particularly chemotherapy, I, I feel could have systemic effects on the immune system that work against immunotherapy. So moving right. up immunotherapy um, in the order of treatment could be in some cases a good idea, but that, has to be determined empirically through clinical trial, of course. Yes, or to as to speak to what you just said, what we're developing, what they're developing now is also more targeted therapy. So instead of these effects being systemic, they would be really just targeted to the tumor itself, yeah. even for chemo or radiation. Okay, Erica, um, and this this will be the the last question of the session. Over the last year, the whole world has been talking about the pandemic and the importance of the immune system in fighting uh, COVID-19. Um, one day the pandemic will be behind us. So what, what are the pr priorities for the La Jolla Institute going forward? Well, the priorities for the Institute are building the tools, the infrastructures and the human teams that could rapidly pivot to whatever problem is needed. We know that human disease usually has an immune component. And if we can understand and have tools to, to figure out how to inspire the right immune response, we can inspire the right immune response against a virus, we can inspire the right immune response against a tumor, we can dial down the wrong immune response in autoimmune disease. While we have been home with COVID and, and pandemic lockdowns, there are a lot of people that have missed their cancer screenings. And there are a lot of people that in the world that have missed their vaccines. And so I think we will unfortunately see that over the last year, our population has gotten a little unhealthier and that we will need to focus more on diabetes, on cancer. We need to support these research programs for all these human diseases. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> thank you very much. Well, I'd like to then conclude by thanking all of our speakers. Um, this is wonderful and very informative. And please go to lji.org, to our website, if you'd like to learn more. And please, uh, if you have the capacity, please support us. There's so much we can do uh, with support from friends like you. And all, all the information is on the screen. And once again, um, uh, it's, it's private philanthropy that has allowed us to make rapid uh, get rapid insights into the pandemic, which you may have heard about, and it will allow us to understand uh, LPC and how it may work uh, in patients going to the future. So thank you everyone and take care. Bye-bye.